Hi, my name is Chris Hughes with Endor Labs, and you're joining Lean AppSec. We'll be having a conversation today focused on open source software strategies for AI. It's going to be a conversation about how AI and LLMs are impacting AppSec in general, as well as open source security and specifically. Uh, the, talk, the purpose of the talk is going to be diving into topics that AppSec leaders and engineers need to get a grasp on, how they should be thinking about internal questions starting to come up in terms of handling uh, AI, and some proprietary versus AI arguments we're likely to hear as well. Uh, today, we're joined by Matt Brown from Endor Labs and Kayla Seema. Hey, Caleb and Matt, thanks for being here. Sure. Uh, I've been uh, in cybersecurity since the 90s, so I've been in this industry a long time. Uh, originally started as a, I guess, researcher, reverse engineer, and pen tester, then moved as into an entrepreneur and starting and uh, you know, basically selling several uh, cybersecurity companies at which I was the CTO and CEO and founder of, did a little bit of stint as a venture capitalist, and then uh, decided to go into the operations defending game and become a CISO uh, for the past, I say, five or six years, both at uh, companies like Databricks, Capital One, and Robinhood. Yeah, Matt, uh, good to see everybody. Um, Solutions Architect here at Endor Labs. Before this, I dabbled a little bit in cloud security and vulnerability management. Uh, before that, I was a very early SE at a, another company that offers uh, software composition analysis, turned into the product specialist for that specific capability. Um, and before that, I was a developer in a previous life. And oddly enough, hated fixing vulnerabilities, but everything's come, you know, full circle here. Um, and yeah, I, I just really, I really like, you know, the whole secure SDLC, building secure pipelines, letting, you know, security teams work really well together with development teams, kind of champion on both sides of it. Um, that whole process itself just super fascinating to me. So very cool. So you both have held uh, a lot of uh, different roles, different unique perspectives, looking at, you know, secure software development and, you know, bringing us to the conversation today. Obviously, you know, Gen, I, Gen AI and LLM has been the craze of the last, especially it feels like the last 12, 18, 24 months has been a hot topic in particular. You know, when it comes to AppSec engineers, you know, looking at things like uh, Jupyter Notebooks or Hugging Face, LLM models, you know, AppSec engineers don't really know where to start in some cases. They're trying to upskill themselves on this front of thinking about, you know, securing LLMs and Gen AI. Any key themes or you know, recommendations to kick the conversation off that we should be thinking about? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll kick off with Matt's comment, which I think was an awesome one, which is, man, I really hate fixing vulnerabilities. Um, I feel like I think you're in good company, right? With Because I think like, oh, oh, yeah. there's what engineer likes fixing vulnerabilities? I'm not sure anyone really does, um, which I do think leads into um, the possibilities of obviously the number one thing people want to think about for LLMs and AI is fixing vulnerabilities because everyone hates it so much. Yeah. It's uh, like, think about it, right? Developers, what do they get paid for? Pushing out new features, building cool stuff. Like that's really what it is. Like we would get a list of a thousand issues in a spreadsheet. Guess where that list would go? In the trash, right? Then we wised up and, you know, once we got a really good practice down, we would take action on it on the ones that we needed to take action on. Can I fix it? Can I do this? Can I do that? Whatever. This was even like, you know, five, six years ago. And even since then, open source has just skyrocketed before even, you know, AI and LMs in the past two years when now it's like just lit, like exponentially upwards because, these models, now anybody can make literally anything. It's kind of bananas. Like uh, OpenAI released the ChatGPT store where you can just go ahead and import anything you want. Guess what all that uses? Open source. Because if somebody else has built it, I'm not going to go ahead and build it. I'm going to go find out what I can use to put it in my application. So is that developer and that developer and that developer. So kind of like where AppSec engineers can start to learn about this stuff, there's a ton of really good resources like mine my go-to personally is either youtube or udemy like that's where i start and i just kind of learn and go there and code along with the instructor and i i really love to start there but there are a ton of other resources papers whatever have you. you can also give some pragmatic you know maybe approaches that you know if you're if you're an app tech engineer and you're like okay where do i start and learning about llms um i would say that there's two approaches that i would take the first approach is learn about the fundamentals and the foundations of what an LLM is. 
So there's so many YouTube videos, tutorials, ways of learning. Yeah. How does an LLM work? Literally, like just learn if I if an LLM receives a string, what does it do with it? How does it think about it? How does it yeah. produce what it does? Um, listen, it's there's a lot of overload of information, but anything you do, learn the fundamentals. You've got to learn the fundamentals. Otherwise, you don't know what's BS and crap and fluff versus mm -hmm. what's not. So learn the fundamentals, the first. The second approach I would say is learn the practical. And so like a good example is just prompt engineering is the practical, right? Is writing prompts is so key and so important. I cannot tell you the level of importance and difference it is. Um, so a great way if you're an app set guy is go take a uh, uh, code and write a prompt. Like you can, you can like what Matt said, go create your own GPT store and see if you can write a prompt that automatically fixes security vulnerabilities. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be super genius or like know everything in order to do this. This is what's amazing about LLMs is you can say, I want to find a way to make an LLM automate remediating cross-site scripting. And you can actually iteratively, probably within half a day, even as yourself, figure out how to write the prompt to get it to where it will actually remediate a cross-site scripting issue in code. So like now, whether it does it at scale is a different thing, but being mm -hmm. able to do it in a POC is a great way to, for you to learn how an LM thinks, how important prompts are, how effective it can really be solving things that you thought were pretty complex. So I, that, that would be some of my recommendation. Yeah, I like my, Matt's recommendation of Udemy. I'm a big fan of Udemy as well as YouTube. Uh, speaking of YouTube resources, you know, Caleb gave a great talk himself, you know, a uh, little humble plug for, for his talk. It was titled Demystifying LLMs and Threats. And I know we won't have, you know, you talked about knowing the fundamentals. We don't have time to unpack all of that here. But, you know, if you had to call out a few key, you know, items that, you know, apps and engineers should keep in mind when we talk about LLMs, like how exactly does an LLM work and where are some of the key threats, you know, they should be primarily concerned with? Liz, I think, you know, how an LLM works is the way you just have to understand it is, um, you know, it is a predictive machine. So it's all about predictions and being able to say it's as simple it, at its core. It's basically saying, what is the next word and what is most likely that next word? Um, and when you understand that, those patterns uh, elevate or escalate. So, for example, if you say, hey, I say a sentence, I smell something that smells like great apple blank. Many people by the majority would say pie is the next word, right? And so you, you predictively said, oh, pie is the next word. You could take that from sentences to structures, to patterns in documents. This is how you can automatically generate a legal document or a contract or, you know, any or a poem or a hip hop song. Like all of these things are patterns in and of themselves that are most predictive. And so, you know, LMs work this way. And once you understand that, then you also understand very simply the way that you can take advantage of that, right? So for example, when you think of things like prompt injection, you can then understand, well, actually the way prompt injection works is because there's no differentiation between a control plane and a data plane. And uh, I think you could probably go look at my talk to, I don't want to get much deeper than under, just like cross-site scripting and SQL injection, right? Uh, cross-site scripting is you know, a browser doesn't know the distinction between its control plane you know, it's code or it's HTML or it's JavaScript markup versus the data, the input being put in. And if you make the data look like the control, then you can obviously execute code. And in LLM, there is no difference. And so that's why prompt injection is so difficult to solve. There's no control characters like less than and greater than and like HTML. There's no single tick marks for like SQL ending and starting a SQL. These things don't exist in LLM. It's just natural language. So then it becomes the power of persuasion. Um, and what's interesting, if you understand that LMs are also about predictability, then you can also force it to predict its own end of a persuasion for prompt injection. You know, you might be able to say, oh, this is great. I've absolutely successfully helped you do this. And then you could make it prompt inject itself, right? Like there's all sorts yeah. of different things and how you think about LMs. But once you understand the fundamentals, the attacks become clearer, the ways you protect against these attacks become clearer. And so that's the one thing I would encourage is no matter what you do from a security perspective, don't just read about the prompt injection techniques, understand how that technique is successful.
Yes, fascinating because when you when you were speaking about that type of threat or, or manipulation, honestly, it made me think of social engineering. Except for in this case, you're not doing it to a human; you're doing it to the LLM. Uh, you know, trying to kind of uh, guide them down a path with prompts or manipulate it in some fashion. Uh, you know, I'm curious from your guys' perspective as well. You know, there's been a lot of discussion around securing AI and Gen AI and LLMs and like the fear, uncertainty, and doubt of a new technology, right? A new integration of technology into the way we work and do things. Um, from your perspective, both of you, you know, what, what do you think are some of the opportunities for AppSec as well? You talked about a little bit earlier about remediating vulnerabilities, for example. What do you think some of the opportunities that LLMs provide too to uh, help improve the efficiency of AppSec? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I can hit that first. So uh, Caleb mentioned a really, really good one is try it with, you know, trying to fix something. That is that is thing number one. I mean, of course, you always want to like, you know, look at it and research, not just blindly and copy and paste code, right? Like I use, I honestly, for vulnerability research, like here, I use it daily to say, okay, I have this block of code. Let's walk through, you know, how this may potentially be executed or, hey, I'm going to give you a call graph of these different methods and functions. How does this method or function end up getting called? Now, I could go ahead and read through that and maybe spend like 30 minutes, an hour to say, okay, yeah, this is pretty clear. Or I could spend five minutes doing it. And it's, it's like, um, you know, like anything else in this world, it's a tool. It, it is a very, very good tool to speed up your work and to speed up your knowledge and your research on how things could work. Like this weekend, I had to take down these super old shelves that in my house or in the garage and they're like, you know, death traps for my child whenever they run around in the garage, right? Like they're super sharp and, you know, like made of steel from like the 1950s. And I could have taken every bolt off with some, with just a regular old wrench, and I could have done that and it would probably take me three hours or I use the impact driver to do that. And it takes me an hour instead. I ended up taking longer because, you know, other problems, but um, like any home improvement project, but it's a tool. It's a tool to make you, to help you work faster, to learn faster. And if anything, it just guides you in the right direction. That's what I really like about it. Of course, just make sure it all makes sense and like, you know, just check it like you would any other work, but that's that's a really huge opportunity. And just like with open source years ago, it allows for innovation faster. It allows for innov- like just for you to be able to do things quicker with a better tool than what you had before. That's how I really, really view it. Yeah, I'll I'll jump on that and also sort of reemphasize what Matt says, which I think a lot of people don't get is AI is not some magic machine that's somehow mm-hmm. going to produce you amazing product or a uh, huge, you know, production outcomes, productivity outcomes, uh, because it's not that it's a tool. And I think you need to know what you want out of that tool and know how to properly use that tool in order to make it so that you get gains. And I think most people are just like, we need to use AI to use AI without having some outcome. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, you know, uh, AI and LLMs is a how, not a why. And so I think it's really important that what Matt said gets taken to heart is what am I trying to achieve and can an AI or LM help me get there faster or better, right? That's really the key thing to think about. And like one one area um, I'd probably note that I think AIs and LMs are really good at that, you know, first, you know, we are at the very, very infancy of us trying to figure out how to make use of these things in great ways, right? Mm-hmm. Like we are super, super early. Um, But one of the things that's very powerful about it is also the same thing that handicaps LMs, which is they are non-deterministic. The fact that everything in in code or in engineering too is is black and white, basically. It's code. It either works or it doesn't work. It compiles or doesn't compile, right? It's either zero or it's a one. Um, The power of LMs is the fact that it both does, it's not zero or one, it's gray, right? There is a, there's a grayness to it. It's non-deterministic. It's not the same every single time. It, it interprets things. It, it, it has variability in terms of what happens. Um, and what makes that both the most powerful is the fact that most of the things we do every day is by humans and by people, and we are non-deterministic and we are fuzzy and we are gray. And so there's a whole step up of automation that can now happen because I can pragmatically 
through LLMs understand and converse in gray and in sort of the variability. Um, and that is a super step up than what we've had before. Unfortunately, the thing that also holds it back is the fact that it is gray and non-deterministic yeah. and I don't yeah. get the same outcomes that I want, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think as you look forward in the future, think about that benefit and that ability and it opens up the world for the kinds of problems that you'll see get solved. Makes sense. I was curious as well. You both talked about, you know, the, the role of LLMs, you know, kind of enhancing productivity from a development perspective. Um, and I think we'll kind of see this happen internally uh, among development peers in their organization as they look to, you know, they're, like Matt talked about, they're incentivized based on uh, burning down backlogs, feature releases, velocity, et cetera. And then obviously externally, you know, among competitors, being proc to the market, market share, you know, things like that. Um, but there could be, of course, uh, you know, the, the temptation to not necessarily check the work, as he talked about, just push it out the door. You know, the, the OM gave us this. It should be right. You know, do you, do you think there's some risk? And obviously, I think there is. But, you know, uh, do you think how do you think organizations go about using this, but also still have some kind of governance and oversight of you know, what's coming out of that before just pushing out the door, for example? I have to think about man this you you got you got to hand me the <laughs> the good one or the yeah, tough the one, one. <laughs> the tough one uh you know like he, here's the challenge <laughs> um i think that we have gone on on almost either extreme on this compliance regulation safety mm. aspect of this um there's there's a it's it's like there's a part of me that loves the fact that out of anything, what we our biggest mistake in the past was we didn't care about safety. We didn't care about what was secure. It you know, things just went out the door and we'll care about that later. And we have clearly shifted, especially with this AI and LM to go with we do care about safety. We do care about mm -hmm. what's happening, which is fantastic that we are being proactive and thinking about it. But I also feel we're going to an extreme. Um, and so, I mean, this is debatable, right? And I think it's debatable based on, so where you sit. And I'm gonna break it you know, very simplistically into two buckets. There is the, will AI kill us all bucket, right? Um, or like, is, is all my corporate data unsafe in AI? Those are the two buckets I'll put as, you know, sort of the areas where I think you see a lot of the safety uh, and regulation come through. Um, I do think that it's great that we're thinking about, will AI kill us, right? Um, I do think it's great that we want to be thoughtful around how we think about this. But I also find that we are on such an extreme, it's causing us to actually, I think, be crippled in terms because mm -hmm. we are creating policies and regulations without knowing and understanding the true ability and impacts and what it really can do on the ground. So it's like you're kind of making things up up here in hopes that whatever happens here will touch something here. And in what we're happening is, is they're missing the mark. And in fact, what's doing, it's crippling our capability. And I personally see large degradations of capability and functionality because of the safety aspect of these yeah. things. That like, oh, what I used to be able to create and do with LMs, I no longer can because somehow, for some odd reason, thinks it's unsafe when it's not, right? And so when you have other countries and everyone else not caring, and they're creating now at the the sort of things out the door and they're moving, right? So yeah. I think there's a there's a balance that has to be thought about there. I I kind of feel we're a little on the extreme there, and then going on the second bucket, which is the well, my I'm a CISO. And LLMs scare me, and I'm cutting off all access uh, to all LLMs because of corporate data. I also think it is an extreme, right? I think it's it, it's just fear of the unknown. Um, and one of the things that I tried doing in, in both uh, CSA and what I'm doing at the Cloud Security Alliance with the AI initiative, as well as my presentations, is bring education and practicality into this, right? Yeah. Which is, by the way, AI security... 98% of the security is nothing around AI is nothing to do with AI itself. It's the mm -hmm. same infrastructure controls and system controls and permissions that we've got. And maybe two or 5% of that is really AI focused things that we've got to figure out how to deal. Model evasions, prompt injections, you know, ethics, all these kinds of things are like, those are things we'll have to figure out. But yeah, that's not the majority of these problem spaces. So I kind of feel we're at an extreme and I kind of feel like the pendulum needs to swing back a little bit towards the middle where we need to take practical approaches to this a bit more. 
I agree with you. And like the, the, that pendulum swing. And I think from extreme to the next one is okay. We can have it, but there's a term. I, f- I forget what podcast, but put a cup of water next to it. Meaning, all right, we'll keep you, we'll let you use it, but there's a cup of water right next to it just in case. And I can dump the water on it and kill it if I need to kind of thing. So just kind of look like anything else. Like if you, you guys remember our CEO says this, remember like 10 years ago about cloud, I'll never put my data in the cloud. I'll never put it in the cloud. What does everybody do now? Everything's in the cloud. Like you store your code, your IP, where do you store it? GitHub in the cloud, GitLab in the cloud. Everything's in the cloud. Um, And now I think we're going to see the same thing here where everybody's, whoa, 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 way too cautious about it. But then in four or five years, oh yeah, yeah, put it out, be used. Who wouldn't use it? That would be crazy if we didn't use it kind of thing. So, you know, you have to just approach it cautiously right but i think one of the other key things is like discoverability like just saying okay if we're going to use lms i want a way to kind of like track this stuff i want a way to find out well, where am i using it um are apps that are in my pipeline coming from an app that you know uh, utilizes lms or uses jupyter notebooks or things like that right like what gets deployed into our production that actually utilizes all this. I think if you have good visibility into that, I think that's a huge, that will relieve a lot of folks that will leave a lot of like pain or, you know, worry, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, I like like Matt's, uh, I was just going to say real quick, I like Matt's parallel around cloud security because it kind of speaks to what Caleb talked about is organizations, some, some cases outright banning the use of these tools and technologies and all that leads to, as we know from experience, is like shadow usage. You know, now security has no visibility or governance around what's actually being used. And like you, yeah. you talked about, you know, getting getting comfortable using it is the way you build competency and actually securing it. So if you ban it, people don't get a chance to build competency in using it. It's likely going to be less secure. And I'm sorry, Caleb, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And by and large, you know, what's been a, a challenge is convincing CISOs that AI security or really LM security as it stands today is a third party risk problem, not a technology problem. Yeah. Um, and however, you know, you know, look, their LMs bring us a risk to your organization and that you can't think about it the same. Like if, if I ask you, hey, what's your disaster recovery plan for an LLM? People are like, what? How, how do I even think about that? <laughs> All right. What are one of those? Or, yeah. Yeah. Or, or like, hey, like w- when you think about containerizing an LLM, w- what do you think about? Like, you know, it's it's how do you test an LLM for its security issues? Like all of a sudden you, you people have to pause. So it's a new way of doing things for sure. Um, and you're going to have to come up with answers on how to answer those questions. Uh, but it's not this like fear, like this thing is going to come in there and all of our data is going to be like exposed. Like that's not the real issue. Yeah, out of curiosity, you talked about third-party risk, and you know we've seen a big push for software supply chain security, whether it's on the proprietary front with third-party you know vendors, on the open source front around governance of open source software. You know, when you talk about the promise and opportunities of AI, you know, from your perspective, both of you, you know, what role do you think we'll see AI play when you talk about like maybe uh, implementing, you know, selecting better dependencies uh, via the use of AI or respond to risk and vulnerabilities faster through the you know, use of AI around open source software? Yeah. Any thoughts on that front? Actually, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, uh, personally something I did where we had a customer that they they wanted to use, have our data feed into GitHub issues. Like that was their ticketing system was GitHub issues. Now, I won't get super into it, but like the integration with tools in GitHub, sometimes you don't have every single one. GitHub issues is typically one of those things, right? You kind of have to like script your way through. So I said to myself, all right, well, I can solution my way out of this or solution a way to make this work by just taking the data from our API, putting it into GitHub's API, making some sort of script that will loop through and automatically create or close GitHub issues uh, when you run it. Um, so again, just putting the developer hat on, I'm like, all right, I'm not going to go through all of GitHub's API and read through it and try to figure it out. There's got to be some component out there that I can use, and I was writing in Python, so like, there's got to be some Python dependency that I can use to interact with GitHub's API. So I could have just Googled it, gone to Stack Overflow, again, maybe spent an hour trying to find a good one, or I could, we have a tool that you can say, hey, find me a dependency that talks to GitHub's API that creates GitHub uh, issues. 
and up pops PyGitHub. And sure enough, the description is a Python client that talks to GitHub's API. Great. I found a component, but well, what about it? Is this a really bad component with a lot of security issues and licenses and copyrights and all this other junk? So, you know, all the data is there about the dependency. Literally everything I need to know about the dependency is all in front of me. So it, it's a really good one. It's actually like, love it. It's great. And, it, you know, it was telling me, hey, it has active maintainers. It's maintained by a corporation. It's, you know, there are people with stars contributing to it all this information. So I picked the right dependency from the beginning rather than Wait, later. Who, who's I'm telling you all this stuff about this dependency? What product is uh, that? It's our, Endor Labs. It's Endor Labs. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, like... <laughs> I didn't want to flaunt it and everything, but, you know... It's, well, it's, no, uh, like, I mean, hey, that's it's valuable information, right? Yeah. Like, you like you could be talking about something else. Like, I wasn't sure, so I wanted to admit, I wanted to verify. Yeah, yeah so it's, yeah. it's your product that basically said, oh, here's what it is, here's all the stars. Everything about it. Every, yeah. Anywhere from, you know, like 140, 150 different data points of just, it's like, oh... And now if I'm a developer and I go to, I go to UK, I'm like, Hey, I want to use this dependency. You just look up that dependency. What pi GitHub, what is this? Oh, everything looks green. It's maintained. It's not an archive. It's not maintained by, you know, Matt Brown in Wayne, New Jersey in his basement where one day he disappears off the face of the earth and now nobody can maintain it and all this other information. So I picked the right one from the get go rather than later. But the point is, I use my own natural language to just ask, what what can I do? What what's a component that I can use? And I just cut down my search time tenfold rather than you know Google and Stack and Overflow everything you know. And, and you know you could also just ask the LM and whether it's through your product or just through uh, yeah. another LM, you could also just say, hey, I'm now using this Pi GitHub. Uh, he, here's what I want to get out of it. Can you just write me the 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 snippet of code exactly. for that function yeah and then it just like exactly. here's i don't need to go read the docs or the read me try to figure out the syntax mm -hmm. of this thing it'll just like here you go here's here's how it works now what was the deal yeah. is if it got into the the actual ide that the engineer is coding so that hey before i start building all mm -hmm. of my code around this library it automatically is giving me this information so i don't I don't get it later at check-in time or yeah. at compile time or run time where this information comes back to me, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is it's kind of speaking to the uh, building security inverse bolting it on or, you know, actually integrating it earlier in the SDLC, for example, is kind of what you're getting at there. Uh, and then he talked about maintainability, for example, or the number of contributors and some of those, you know, kind of key indicators around the health of an open source software project or library. Uh, Caleb, I know you've had some thoughts in the, that we've talked about a little bit off air, uh, which is, you know, maybe uh, threats to the open source software ecosystem from the product development perspective could, you know, given how quickly uh, product teams or, you know, proprietary vendors now can iterate with LLMs and Gen AI. Any thoughts that you want to elaborate on that front? Yeah, there's so, you know, at a broad level, there's there's so many different aspects around, OK, when I think about this, how is AI going to affect open source? Right. And what is going to happen there? Um, and when you think about both, you know, producing or building an open source project, um, you know, very similar to what like Matt was saying earlier around cloud, right? When when cloud came out, it was pushed because, hey, the what used to take me 50 uh, IT, you know, engineer guys to build a data center and manage it, I can now do it with three people, right? Like it went from 50 mm -hmm. to three. And then similar, I think, at an application layer. AI has said what used to take 30 or 50 engineers, you can now do with three engineers. And so now when you start thinking about that power and the ability to iterate so fast and so quickly using this tool, and you start thinking about open source libraries and the ability to adapt those things and then build on top of it or even build your own versions of that becomes much, much less of a barrier, right? You can probably take AI, take open source libraries and recreate your own versions of these things pretty damn quickly. And I think there's some fear, like, for example, I, I have a, a portfolio company that is an open source, you know, cybersecurity focused startup. And they've had lots of issues where they produce really great product in open source software. And what happens is their competitors are taking that and immediately turning it into commercializer. Mm -hmm. And we call it AWSing it. 
right? They're taking this thing, they're converting it into these services uh, and then like offering it and they're taking all the benefits that they're doing. And so like is AI, AI is going to help exp- expedite that pro- that process. And so I do think, it, you know, it's an interesting maybe debate or thought uh, uh, challenge around will AI accelerate more open source or will you see it actually decrease open source in the future uh, would be an interesting thing to debate about. Yeah, I want to ask something in a similar vein. You know, we've seen a, a growth of not only proprietary vendors, of course, using these technologies, but open source software communities oriented around you know machine learning and AI and open source libraries, pre pre-trained models, uh, things of that nature that users can go and quickly leverage. You know, where are some key considerations that organizations need to keep in mind before using these? And you kind of spoke to one, which is everyone can access it, right? And this isn't an AI specific, you know, concern, but everyone can access it. That's the nature of open source. What are some other considerations, you know, from a security perspective, for example, before going and use pre-trained, pre-trained models or open source libraries, things of that nature that are out there in these thriving ecosystems that we're seeing now? I think the, the anyone can access them is like the root of a tree. Yeah, anybody can access them, right? That means anybody can put stuff in it. That means anybody can change something in it. That means anybody can hijack it. That means anybody can... Even like, this is a really interesting one. It's the whole typo squatting thing and the whole dependency confusion, name confusion thing, where instead of an I, you put a lowercase L or something like that. So because it's open source, anybody can access it, which means anybody can do anything they want to it. And if you're not careful, and let's say, here's a scenario I could see happening is uh, I'm a malicious developer. I open a pull request that contains, I don't know, crypto miner, whatever, right? Malicious code of some kind. And some AI automated merge request puller or merge request bot that runs on AI in some Git service and GitHub or GitLab, whatever have you. I'm not saying like this exists now, but I could see this down the line. Automatically merges it because, oh yeah, this looks good. Like I'm trained in previous code and I don't see anything fishy here. Let me go ahead and merge it. And then it gets pushed out. And then 2 million people go ahead and download it before it gets caught. Like I could see something like that happening. And you're, I don't want to make another acronym, but like ML supply chain ops or something like that, where it's like, okay, instead of us thinking about a dependency as a confusion or as a dependency, as a um, a component, like just some component, a GitHub Actions is a dependency. An LLM could be a dependency. Anything, anything your software depends on is a dependency. So that's that's kind of that's like kind of what I can see happening in the next like few years. Yeah, like or so. you know, um, the aspect that an a, an attacker is going to use AI in order to generate the top, you know, five hundred thousand most common misspellings of every single library probably contained in open source so that they can then sort of typo squat on those for that issue can, you know, has been done already, right? Like, oh, totally. Yeah. And like before, I think LLMs, this would have been a challenging feat to say, oh, Mm -hmm. let's take something like, you know, name a dependency, you know, GitHub. And I just want to, I want to iterate, let's say the top, give me 30 misspellings. That would be the most common for GitHub. LM spit that out just like that. Yeah. And you just take, yeah. go crawl through every single dependency, include in every code and give me the top 30 misspellings. And now you've got this massive list that is just like open doors coming in. So, yeah. you know, it's really yeah. easy. It's going to make the attacker's job a lot easier. I was going to say, so that that's a good and Caleb, you correct me if I'm wrong here. That's a, I would view that as an excellent example of prompt engineering. Don't ask it, oh, hey, I want to, you know, pick me some malicious names I can go ahead to do dependency, dependency confusion with. Give me misspellings. I'm just curious. I want to do some misspellings. Kind of yes, thing. that's right. Right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Give me the I'm top 30 it. misspellings for, uh, right. for Zoom. Mm -hmm. (laughs) right like okay z-o-o-o-m yeah 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 z-o-o-o-m z-o-o-m-m you know there's there's so many different uh that do and you know lms are going to be smart enough to know that the keys are are close by so an x instead of uh a z or like it'll Mm -hmm. automatically determine that stuff for you so you know it's you know it's really fascinating on the attacker's level of uh benefit that they're going to get from this. 
So I want to ask on the flip side to maybe bounce it out a little bit, you know, from the everyone can contribute kind of uh, thought process. That means everyone can contribute to, to it, you know, data scientists, people who have specialties in AI and engineering and uh, software development can contribute contribute to it in a positive way too. Uh, so maybe the last question to take us out here is, you know, how do we kind of balance it out and, and kind of, you know, uh, consider the risk, obviously, of using these things from the open source software community, but also understand the value of leaning into pre-trained models and open source libraries that may be able to use, may be useful, you know, from a software development perspective around AI. Um, you know, how do we balance that risk out so that, you know, security leaders in the organization are simply not too standoffish of leaning into that, you know, open source community and the thriving ecosystem that we see too? You got to like stop for a second. You know what I mean? Like a lot of this stuff happens because think of it at any part of your daily life. Like you're doing something so fast that you don't like just stop to think for a second. Right. And to say like, oh, okay, did I type that right? Or like, let me just double check it. Let me make sure. So like, just like kind of pump the brakes for a second. And before you just go ahead and all willy nilly import everything you want, like, let's, let's look at it first. Let's just go back to grade school and it's like, okay, double check your work. Like let's double check our work real quick kind of thing. Like this morning I was, I got two, I have a 10 month old girl and a three year old girl and I'm trying to feed the three year old girl, give her toast and, and the 10 month old is crying and all this stuff. And she's on the counter and my wife and I are trying to make some breakfast and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I gave my daughter her vitamins. Like she has the chewable vitamins, but I didn't twist the cap on all the way. Cause I'm just doing like 900 things at once. And then before you know it, I see the 10 month old on the counter with a bottle full of chewable vitamins. And I'm like, ah, so just, you know, kind of like, hang on, is the 10 month old going to get into some medicine here or are things like set right now? And they just like kind of making sure you, you know what you're actually putting into your application, you know, what's going on with it, taking a second to just breathe and like take a deep breath and like, look at, okay, Am I working on what am I working on? What am I working on and what, you know, is safe or dangerous or something like that? I think that's a good my rule of thumb anyway. If I if I had sort of one last thing, uh, I would probably push on. I actually made a LinkedIn post about this just recently. I think it's about the fear, or at least the what I see is the the FUD around AI generated code. Um yeah. I see constant people saying, oh, my God, AI is generating the code. It's going to be super insecure. It's causing way more vulnerabilities. Uh, this is very scary. We cannot allow. We have to detect when we see AI generated code because it's bad. Um, I just want to put sort of a draw a line in the stand here yeah. and say that from this point forward, you should assume everything is going to be AI enhanced. Right. It doesn't yeah. mean like, oh, like, oh, this image is AI created, therefore it's bad, or this code is AI created, therefore it's bad. It's it's a, an artist or a photo is going to be AI modified and enhanced. Code mm -hmm. is going to be AI modified and enhanced and or created. And the fact is, is that if you're so worried that AI creates that much code, then that means you are already in a crap position because you're not testing things. And you're not, there's no accountability of the engineers who are still committing this code that they are writing using AI. Mm -hmm. And so this whole fear of this to me is so overblown uh, and fear, it feels like more FUD in preventing the ability and giving, no, no offense here, but security people more things to do, right? Like yeah. at the end of the day, like you use AI, use LMs, and you as an engineer are responsible for the code that which you commit. It should be tested the way it needs to be tested, and you should be accountable for that code. And every piece of code, whether it's human generated or AI generated, mm -hmm. or what I really think is going to happen is AI assisted by human generated in every code base, it's going to be it's going to be the norm. So accept it and adapt to it. Yeah, well said. I think that's uh, kind of speaking to the new reality that we find ourselves in and we'll find, us in, or find ourselves in moving forward. Uh, so that's, that's going to take us out for this session, Open Source Software Strategies for AI. Matt, Caleb, thanks for joining us and thanks for everyone for tuning in.